All right. It's like we have a lot of people here and we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we have our final week in our eight week checklist. So exciting. Um, this week is your final week of the checklist, which is still a few weeks away before you get to campus. So um, time to kind of like tie up those loose ends um, and envision what it's going to be like when you come to campus and at the end of August. Colin, do you want to introduce our guests? I'd love to introduce our guests. Um, so joining us today, we have the first year experience team, Jonathan, Melanie, Colin, and Judith. So um, excited for this last week of webinar. Um, also, we have a reappearance of one of our fan favorite campus employees, um, Francesca Span, doing the operations with Campus Living. And also, a appearance from Ryan Jensen, who is the general manager of Bon Appetit Food Service. So we're excited for today. Awesome. Thanks, Colin. Okay, so your tasks for this week, hopefully I'm I'm guessing a lot of you are preparing and doing those final last minute details, putting courses in your shopping cart because tomorrow is day one of registration. Um, so remember, you're going to register tomorrow for one class. Uh, be sure to double check Web Advisor and see what time your registration is for. Uh, it might be in the morning or in the afternoon. And remember that that is Pacific time. So you might need to do some math. Make sure you're getting on at the right time. Um, that is on Wednesday, July 31st. And then on Friday, that is when you have your second round of registration. Uh, you likely have talked with your advisor, but most likely you're looking to register for two classes on that day because you will have registered for one on Wednesday. You will have already been registered for either your words or numbers course. And then likely you'll want to fill up um, to get four courses for fall semester. So you'll do two uh, course registrations on Friday. Some other little tasks you have this week are to submit your service day form. So that means make sure that you can log in to give pulse. Um, you might need to make sure that you're logging single sign on when you do that. So log in to give pulse and that will allow you to register for the service day, which is happening on Saturday um, of NSO, which I believe is August 31st. Um, and then we have new student survey that should have been emailed to you. Um, and then finally, the common reading, which will be sent to you very shortly. Monica, can I little... jump in real quick? The new student survey is going to come out on uh, the 1st. So I believe that is Thursday. So look for your email. Uh, you'll get a link. It'll actually be coming from an organization called uh, the Heads Consortium. Uh, but that's when you'll first receive it. And you'll get a few reminders if you don't get to it right away. Thanks, John. A reminder that we have our Q&A open. Um, and so we'll be looking and answering questions throughout the webinar. If questions pop up, feel free to ask them in the Q&A at any time during the webinar. Um, and then we'll take some time at the end uh, to answer any questions that you have for us. So I'm gonna kick it over to Ryan to talk a little bit about Bon Appetit, meal plans, food service, all of that fun, delicious stuff. Great, uh, thanks. Uh, welcome to everyone who is on the call today. Um, and, and thank you to First Year Experience for letting me join. I just wanted to uh, share for a couple of minutes a little bit about Bon Appetit and myself and then some of our more frequently asked questions. Um, some of this you'll want to, um, if you have ad advanced questions, reach out to me before your arrival um, so we can solve this for you. Um, so Bon Appetit is a food service company that does the, the meals here at Lewis and Clark um, and many other locations all over the country. Um, we cook food uh, predominantly from scratch, sourcing locally and sustainably as much as possible. Um, one of the reasons that we do this uh, is to make sure that we can be very clean and transparent um, with our food to meet anyone's specific dietary needs. 
um, a lot of students who are coming in um, may not have had to determine what their meals are going to be every time that they're hungry for the last several years. So learning how to navigate what our offerings are uh, and learning how to um, advocate and come and talk to us when you need some assistance with something is going to be um, very important. Um, we have about 40% of our students are on some kind of modified or restricted diet. Um, that can include um, if you're a vegan, if you're vegetarian, if you're avoiding gluten, if you have allergies or medical sensitivities. Um, some people will have um, uh, dietary laws that they need to follow for religious purposes. Some of our students uh, need very specific um, caloric intake numbers or macronutrient balance outside of what we would consider average uh, in the US. Um, and one of the nice things about the way that we cook um, is we're able to really kind of tailor that food uh, towards people's individual needs. Um, that said, we're cooking meals for a thousand people. And every time you come in to eat, you might not find your, your preferred food item, but there are a lot of ways to hack the main dining room, um, the bone, if you will. Um, and you'll learn that from other students and, and our great student newspaper and just kind of observing things. Um, but to, to break it down, we try to make our food as simply as possible. We break things into components, um, vegetables and, and starches and proteins. Um, so you can kind of go around the cafe and grab the food that you need and that you want. Um, we know some people love spicy food and some people hate spicy food. Um, so we try to kind of keep those things separated um, so that you can um, put together a meal that that kind of meets your needs um, dietarily and, and also your preferences. Um, our labeling, uh, which is in our cafe on the signs, uh, also digitally on our website um, and can be sent to you via email every morning uh, by joining menu mail. All are marked with little color-coded icons that will indicate if a food item is vegan or vegetarian or made without gluten. Um, if it's what is considered a, a well-balanced meal option, um, those are all kind of in there to help indicate uh, to an extent the ingredients, but also to help you steer yourself towards the, towards the food that you need and that you would prefer. Uh, we do label very clearly the nine major recognized allergens, um, gluten, dairy, soy, egg, um, peanuts or ground nuts, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, and sesame. Um, if anyone has a, a nut specific concern, we are a completely nut free campus. Um, I say that we label those because we would if we, uh, but we, we don't bring those into our, into our cafe at all. Um, if you are for one reason or another living a gluten free lifestyle, um, we do have uh, options available. We use a, a term made without gluten because we are not a certified gluten-free kitchen, but that indicates that we didn't use any ingredients um, that had gluten. Um, if you have an extreme sensitivity um, or allergy to it, uh, we do offer uh, gluten-free options at, at all. For example, on pasta night, we will have gluten-free pasta. We do have gluten-free bread, um, but we generally will keep those behind the line um, on quesadilla day you could ask for a quesadilla made with a corn tortilla, for example, but we don't put that stuff out um, because of the extreme sensitivity that some guests have. And since our main cafe is self-service, that provides a lot of opportunities for cross-contamination. Um, if you, as an individual, have any, any big food sensitivities, allergies, uh, things you need to avoid, or if you're just a little overwhelmed with food that you need to eat, um, my email address and phone number are are right there on the slide right now. And I encourage you to get a hold of me ahead of time or certainly within those first few days that you arrive because it's important to us that you're able to find the nutrition um, that you need. I have a really good team. We all care about students. That's why we do what we do. Um, you just have to, to come and talk to us. Um, and if you have a more advanced concern um, and it's something that it seems like it will be difficult for us to meet um, those specific needs, I'm I'm a good resource to help kind of direct you to campus partners that could assist you with that. Um, one of the things that that is part of your checklist before you arrive is to select a meal plan. Um, and there are a couple that that most of our incoming students will select. Um, 
the 19 meal plan, the 14, I, I'm doing hand gestures, but they're not on screen, I'm sorry. Um, the 19 meal plan, the 14 meal plan, and the 14 flex. Um, and really quickly, if you're still trying to figure out what meal plan you need to be on, if you wake up early every day and you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day, or you have to get a lot of, of meals in, the 19 meal plan is, is the best choice for that. Um, we do have a 14 with no flex option, which if you're reviewing the bill is the, the least expensive of them. Um, that assumes that you're gonna eat two meals a day. Uh, maybe you're not an early riser, or maybe you're gonna have you know, off-campus activities that you're gonna do in the evening. Um, and then we have the 14 flex, which gives you um, credit on your student ID that can be used for additional meals, it can be used in our market to get groceries and snacks, uh, it can be used to get coffee, um, those kind of things. I did a little math based on the numbers at the end of last semester to give to give all of you an idea of what plans students tended to be on by the end of the year, uh, which is a little different than what people start the year with. So this might help you decide. The 19 all access plan, 8% of our students selected that plan. The 14 meal plan, uh, we had 21% of our students on that plan. And the 14 flex uh, is by far our most common and popular, and we had 71% of students on that plan. Um, again, if you have special dietary needs and need a little help kind of talking through um, my suggestions, having done this for 19 years, um, feel free to get a hold of me. Um, in terms of meal plan changes, I get a lot of emails and visits to my office the first week of school with people wanting to change their meal plans. Uh, and that is uh, actually handled by Campus Living uh, and through your, your student housing portal. And you will have until the end of the first week of school to make those changes. So you have a little bit of time to figure out, do I really wake up at 6.30 in the morning on a Tuesday to go get breakfast? Or do I stop and get a coffee? Um, in terms of the way the meal plans work in general, when I say a 14 per week meal plan, that is 14 meals to use as you desire amongst our 21 meal periods, Monday through Sunday. So you could have two a day, you could have three one day and, and one the next day, however you wanna make that work out with your academic and, and social schedule. After dinner on Sunday night, any remaining meals go away and we restart at 14 on Monday morning. Um, so if you're trying to maximize the value of your meal plan, um, the 19 may or may not be realistic. Maybe you just want to get some Pop-Tarts for your room, right? And grab a cup of coffee or a bagel, as I said. Um, the flex points that are attached, if you get the 14 flex, those will remain on your account all through fall semester. Any remaining flex points will be on your account in the spring semester and get added to the refill of the points, but those will go away at the end of the spring semester. Um, so there's a little bit of learning in terms of budgeting to go there. If you do run out of flex points, you can add more. Um, you can ask for that for a, a, a birthday gift or a holiday gift or something like that. We're happy to help you out. Um, and any meal plan points that are purchased outside of your board plan, those will stay on your account until you're done actively being a member of the community. Um, so you don't have to worry about those going away. It's only those 14 flex points that will go away in May. Um, I have a question. Um, where do you select your plan? Uh, in the student housing portal, um, Fran could could uh, specify that. Um, if you do not select a plan at all, you will be defaulted to the 14 flex. So I recommend that, that you go in there if you think you have some uh, specific needs and, and edit that. Um, I do have students who think they are on the 19, and then they come in on Sunday and they're out of meals because they were defaulted to the 14 flex. So we can avoid that ahead of time. Um, we have uh, all you care to eat in the main dining room. I suggest that uh, if you are a, a, a big eater uh, or you're uh, a more, that you try to stick to the main dining room because that has the most options available. Uh, and since it's all you care to eat, you can grab as much or as little as you want. Um, and you have a little more customization. Our other main food location, which serves about a third of our meals each day is the trail room, um, which if you've taken a tour, you probably saw. We specialize in uh, pizzas, salads, chicken strips, vegan strips, fries, that kind of stuff. Um, that's a, a place you should avoid, uh, specifically if you have celiac or gluten concerns. We have a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. We work with whole grains. Um, sometimes students find food that they've never had before. 
um, a little less now than a few years ago, but you might have your first experience eating quinoa um, or trying to figure out what is kohlrabi or, or kale. Um, welcome to Portland. That's, that's how we do things here. Um, that doesn't mean that you're not going to find ice cream and cookies uh, and french fries, uh, but we do have healthy food available um, and we encourage people to try stuff, especially when it's in season. Um, to, to reiterate on, on all of the what do we offer and, and where is it and how do I get it, um, if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you need assistance with wayfinding, um, most of my job uh, revolves around helping students bridge that gap. Um, so please feel free to, to get in touch with me. Um, okay, I have another question. Um, can meal pl plans be changed after the first semester? Yes. Uh, if you find yourself on the wrong meal plan, um, you can definitely change that for the next semester. Um, let's see. I have, are flex points worth the same as dollars? Yes, uh, one flex point is worth $1. Um, if you go into our market, um, we are not the same as a grocery store. It is not designed for you to come in and, and buy a week's worth of groceries. Um, it's it's a place to kind of get some snacks and some staples. If you need a gallon of milk, you need some eggs, you, you need aforementioned Pop-Tarts, um, you need some frozen entrees, that's what you're gonna find there. Um, but don't plan on relying that for all of your dietary needs. Um, how many flex points for a meal? Um, it depends on which meal you are coming in to dine, they're dollar for dollar. Um, I believe the fall prices are about six fifty for breakfast and about ten fifty for lunch, dinner, and brunch. Um, those are still being finalized, but that's that's a ballpark. Um, if you are going to use flex points for meals, if you have the fourteen flex, for example, and you want breakfast, use your flex points for breakfast, and then use your meal swipes for lunch and dinner. That'll give you a much better value um, on uh, the purchase you're making. If you do uh, find that you need to buy more flex points, if you run out. Um, it's tempting to go to a credit card or Apple Pay um, to pay for your coffees each day. Um, but if you come to our office and you purchase more flex points, if you add $75 or more at a time, you get a 10% bonus. Um, so depending on how you look at that, that's either 10% more spending money or everything is 10% off. Um, six of one, half a dozen of the other. Um, let's see, if, if it's too late to change the selection from 19 to 14 flex, for the semester? If not, where can we do that? Uh, no, it's not too late. Um, you have until the end of the first week of school. Um, and again, I, I believe that you can do that on your end. Um, and if you don't do that through the student housing portal, you can visit Campus Living to do that during the first week. Yeah, Ryan, um, just to jump in here really quick, when you log into you. the housing portal, there is actually a button that says add or change meal plan. So if you click that button, it'll let you choose a different meal plan. If you're struggling, feel free to just email the living at oclerk.edu account and we can manually change it for you. Awesome. Thank you, Fran. I appreciate that. Um, the only other part of my spiel is we do hire students. Um, if you're coming to campus and you are looking for work, we tend to hire up. Uh, for student workers within the first couple of weeks of a semester, and we do not require work study um, for these positions. So um, there's a student job board and there are postings all over campus, but if you have an interest in people and interacting or cooking food, or you don't want to be anywhere near people and you just want to wash dishes and listen to music, um, we have those kind of positions for people. So um, again, you can feel free to get in contact with me for that. Uh, and I think that's about all I've got. Thanks so much, Ryan. Um, okay, next up, we are going to talk. I'm just going to give a brief mention of coming to campus. So this webinar is about preparing for arrival. So preparing for what it looks like when you come to campus. Um, we have NSO. You might have seen that acronym floating around. NSO stands for New Student Orientation. And New Student Orientation will happen from Wednesday, August 28th. Till Sunday, September 2nd. Um, there will be additional activities on Monday as well, um, but that is Labor Day. Um, and then classes start on Tuesday. We also, during that same time, have our parent and family preview, which happens on August 28th and August 29th, Sunday, September 1st. My bad. I put the wrong date in there. Sorry. Um, so, parent and family preview from Wednesday to Thursday. Um, I am going to post 
copy in the chat here a link in case you haven't registered yet and you're interested in registering for a parent and family preview. You can register there. Um, there there's options if you would like to register for uh, just Thursday or for Wednesday and Thursday. Um, you can browse a little bit about what that looks like. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out um, about parent and family preview. And now I'm going to pass it on to Fran. And I'm also going to give you side control, Fran, so that you can go through your slides as needed. Awesome. Thank you so much, Melanie, and all of FYE. Uh, my name is Francesca. I also go by Fran. I use she, her pronouns. And I do a lot of different jobs within the Office of Campus Living. Um, but I'm here to talk about what move-in day will look like, what arrival on campus will look like. And then I'll pass it over to um, Colin and Judith to talk more so on the NSO welcome side and what um, students will be experiencing during their first week and first semester. With that being said, we will jump right into coming to campus. Um, I know Melanie just mentioned um, that both NSO and Parents Preview start Wednesday, August 28th, um, but the reality is that we will see students, new students, coming to campus before NSO move-in day. And the reason why we see students come early is because they are part of an early arrival group. So I just want to preface that we are going to be spending a lot of time talking about the first day of NSO and the official new student move-in day, but you may very well be a student who is a part of one of these other early arrival groups who's going to come early. This includes uh, fall athletes, so if you're on a fall sport team, uh, we're anticipating your arrival on campus on August 15th. Um, we'll also see new students arrive early if they're part of an on-campus NST. If you're on the Creative Arts NST, you will move into your fall assignment when you arrive on campus. I believe it's the 20th. I could be slightly off with my dates. Um, around that same time frame, we will welcome our international new students to campus. So if you're participating in ISO as an international student or a TCK, you will also move into campus early. And then finally, we have our outdoor slash off-campus NSTs. If you're a member of one of those NSTs, you'll come to campus early to check in and depart on your NST, uh, and you won't actually move into your fall assignment until you've returned from your NST on the 27th of August, so that's on Tuesday. A really common question I get asked for students who are going on those off-campus NSTs is, what should I tell my parents or guardians about my move-in day because I do get back on the 27th? Uh, the answer is that you will be sleeping in your room the 27th into the 28th. Official move-in day isn't until the 28th, so that'll be a better time for your parents or family members to come with a lot of your stuff. But if they're in town and they want to see you on the evening of the 27th, you will be back on campus. For the rest of our new students who aren't part of one of these early arrival groups or participating in an NST, we'll be anticipating your arrival to campus on move-in day, which is Wednesday, August 28th. We will begin our um, residential check-in process outside of each of the residential halls starting at 8.30 a.m. Campus Living will send students an email with more details about um, check-in and arrival on campus. Uh, the one thing I want to throw out there is if you are a parent, guardian, or friend of a new student who's coming and you are trying to uh, pre-plan out some of your logistics, something to keep in mind is that we, we are a small school and we are not a, a very large residential campus. So if you are anticipating um, a move-in uh, similar to a really big university or a process that happens when they're onboarding thousands of students into residence halls. Things just look a little bit different here on our campus. The slow trickle in of students arriving for different early arrival groups means that on Wednesday, August 28th, it's still a fairly busy day, but it is certainly not as um, busy and bustling as some larger state colleges that have a lot of people coming to campus all at once. So. Just want to put that into perspective that traffic and uh, just comings and goings are not as uh, tricky to navigate. 
Um, when you do make your way to campus, um, most people are going to be arriving coming off of the I-5 uh, freeway. And so, again, you have access to Google Maps or some type of internet search. I do suggest you try and just map yourself to campus. Um, but as a general rule, um, the easiest way to find your way towards your residential hall for move-in is going to be using Gate 5. I have a visual on an upcoming slide. Um, but gate five is really our main gate into the residential side of campus. And so regardless if you're coming from I-5 or a different part of Portland, Oregon, um, using gate five entrance into the res halls is going to be your easiest way to go. Once you're done checking in uh, and moving into your residential halls, as well as orientation, we do ask that you move your cars out of the loading zones. There will be loading zones in front of every residence hall for about 20 minutes. That gives you some great time to remove all your items from your room, bring them into your residential room, and then move your car. Uh, there's going to be a lot of signage on campus helping you navigate which parking lots are available and open, um, but gate seven and gate two are great options for parking on either our graduate campus lot or in gate two near the stadium. The stadium is going to be near the NSO welcome, so if you're strategic or you just dislike walking, you might want to choose gate two um, as a kind of easy escape route once we hit the end of new student orientation welcome. Okay, uh, just a few tips as far as moving goes. Um, there will be package collection. I believe FYE has already sent out an email about sending packages to campus. Students are welcome and able to send items to campus for package collection on Wednesday, August 28th. Um, you are responsible for collecting those items from the mail service and bringing them back to your residential room. That being said, you are also welcome to either borrow one of the mail services dollies or hand carts or pull a car around and load up your items and drive them back to your residential hall. While it might be convenient to send some items over to Lewis and Clark College ahead of time, I do just want to remind everyone that you can still buy things here in Oregon. Um, it, we have a few uh, stores close to campus um, that you can do a lot of purchasing for your residential hall room. And one nice thing about Oregon is there's no sales tax. So uh, I would just try and refrain from um, purchasing things and shipping them from your house when you can just buy them here in the state. As far as some other things to just remember as you are packing for your uh, move to Portland, Oregon, um, if you're planning on um, applying for any on-campus jobs, you will need materials that show um, different forms of ID and other things like that. There is a list online of materials that our Human Resources Office needs from new students when they are um, applying for jobs, so keep that in mind. Do not uh, forget that there is, in fact, weather in Oregon. I am from Southern California, so this was something I was not prepared for. Um, this was also a great opportunity to use some of that Oregon um, no sales tax and do some winter weather purchasing once I made it here to Oregon. And kind of along those same lines, our biggest suggestion is to not overpack. Um, it can be uh, really exciting to want to bring a lot of cute outfits and shoes. I will guarantee you that you will default to a lot of your regular comfortable outfits. And in a city full of thrift stores and vintage shops, you will be buying things once you're here. So try and keep your packing to a minimum, as well as coordinate with potential future roommates about what you're bringing that they might not need to bring. You certainly don't need two different water kettles in your room. All right, uh, here's just a map. I'm not sure how well this is actually coming across on the Zoom, um, so I do apologize if it is maybe not the most uh, easily visible, but you will see uh, that gate five is denoted with that um, white five and kind of the black box, and it's right in between our Odell Hall and Ponderosa Halls. So uh, when you're coming to campus, that is the gate that you will turn into. Um, and that is also the gate you can exit after you have uh, unloaded and begun to settle into your room. And let's see, I 
think, yes, the same map also oops, uh, circles um, gate two. That is a great place to park once you're done um, unloading or gate seven, which is closer to the graduate school's um, campus and is also convenient, if, especially if you're living in uh, the Forest Hall complex. Okay, that's everything I have to share um, about moving in. Again, uh, drop off and things do look a little bit different here. Uh, that being said, there will be many folks around campus helping with volunteers and wayfinding. So if you're ever lost, feel free to wave someone down. Probably in an orange shirt is a pretty good indicator that they're associated with the college and they'll definitely be able to help you out. Um, I see that there are some questions here from folks about move-in. I'm going to try and answer these questions towards the end of our webinar and pass it over to Colin to talk more so about NSO and we'll loop back around to those Q&As. Awesome. That sounds great. <laughs> Um, Do you want to talk about NSO or um, I'm happy to take on, I'll talk about NSO. I'll trust welcome. you, Melanie. And then you're I trust gonna... you, Melanie. <laughs> and then I think you're going to tell us a little bit more later about our new student peer mentors, right? Would love to. Perfect. Um, I would like to also drop something in the chat here. This is a list um, on the first year experience website that has some tips and some recommendations specific to Lewis and Clark about what you should bring to college. So if you're looking for like, where do I even start? Uh, what should I not bring? Um, there's a link there. I'm also going to ask Judith to maybe give us a little um, behind the scenes thoughts on things to bring to campus from your own experience. Judith, do you want to just briefly mention you, your experience with coming to campus and what you brought? Uh, yeah, well, I did get in contact. I lived in a quad my first year. So just getting in contact with my roommates and then seeing what each one of us was bringing. And we split the costs of our mini fridge all together um, because there's no reason to really have more than one mini fridge in one room. Um, and instead of an iron, I do recommend a steamer if that that's a better alternative. Uh, as well as just no open coils um, in the dorms. That's one of our rules to prevent any fires and just most of the things you can buy here. The, what Fran said with no sales tax in Oregon really shows when buying a lot of items, setting up for moving in and or anything really to like help organize and maximize the space that you have will really be helpful. Thanks, Judith. Okay, I'm gonna pop over here. Okay, so um, new student orientation is going to start with our welcome day, which a big first half of the day is move-in. Um, so lots of time to move things in, move things out, maybe go off campus and pick some things up if you need to. Um, and there will be other um, tables and offices that are um, sharing information throughout that first half of the day. Um, and then at 2 p.m. is when check-in is going to close and we are going to move over to Griswold Stadium um, to have our welcome sort of kickoff assembly, if you will, um, with all of our parents and families and all of our new students. Um, that will begin at 2.30. So that is kind of the time that we are shooting for. If you're going to get in on Wednesday, you definitely want to make it before 2 p.m. Um, so that you can check in to new student orientation. You can also check into your residence hall um, because all students will be checking into different residence halls. That is all going to happen kind of wherever you're going to be living. Um, one thing that I would like to point out about checking into your residence hall is that is where you're going to get your ID card. So once again, I'd like to give a little shout out for getting your ID photo 
um, submitted before you come to campus. Uh, if you haven't yet, I know our deadline was last week on Friday, but if you can, if we can trickle in a few today, I think we can still get them um, into that big list and group of photos that will be printed before you arrive to campus. Um, the benefit of doing that is that you're going to get your ID card right there at your residence hall. Um, that card will be ready for you to swipe to get food in the in the dining halls. Um, and you won't have to wait in line at uh, campus safety, which a lot of schools will make you do that on the first day of orientation. But if you're able to take your photo beforehand, please do. If you're having trouble with it, email us at first year. Um, and we will help you troubleshoot and get those in if you're still working on it or you're having uh, issues. Okay, um, after the kickoff, we you're going to go off into your groups um, and you're gonna meet your new student peer mentor. And this is where I'm gonna pass it over to Colin to tell us a little bit about What's an NSPM? Like, what is this fun acronym? We do love our acronyms at Lewis and Clark. <laughs> Thank you, Melanie. Uh, so yeah, what's a new student peer mentor? Also known from our peers as NISPMs or NSPMs. Um, new student peer mentors are part of the first year experience office. Um, they're a current undergraduate student. We have um, sophomore juniors. Um, and seniors um, working as new student peer mentors this year. And basically, um, the first kind of job of a new student peer mentor is to lead um, you, the student, and your FIGs through orientation in the fall semester. Um, another acronym, we love our acronym, uh, FYG. FYG is going to be first year groups. So just kind of to elaborate on that a little bit more, once you kind of come in during the first week, of new student orientation, you're gonna be placed with a group of um, other first year students um, and you're going to go through all of the kind of like um, first year experience kind of new student orientation events together during that, um, during that week. Um, that group is also going to be part of your um, words and numbers class for the fall semester. So you're actually gonna have all your friends in class um, coming around with you um, for NSL, which is super cool. Um, and the new student parent mentor does not stop there. We don't leave you after NSO. We keep going. Um, it's gonna, they're gonna be your peer mentor throughout the fall semester. So if you're having kind of like any trouble navigating like the social relationships at Lewis and Clark, if you're having struggle with like campus living or like housing or like roommate drama, um, the new student peer mentor is there to kind of be a support system and also kind of um, give you advice and direct you to resources that you need. Um, and they also do something cool, which will be showcased on the next slide, which is they actually um, have an off-campus excursion with your first year group. So um, I was a first year, peer, uh, I was a new student peer mentor last year. And for last year, I brought all of my students to Powell's books and we learned how to use the public transportation system um, in Portland and it was super fun. But you also have one-on-ones with your peer mentor. So they kind of like check up on you, seeing how your classes, how your first year is going, making sure that there's like kind of like a support system going and a line of communication. Um, and it's not just that one off that campus excursion. Uh, your new student peer mentors will be doing three, maybe even more um, kind of like adventures with the first year groups. Um, I also did like a movie night and kind of like an assembly hall with my first year groups. So there's gonna be an off-campus one and a few more um, other events with your new student peer mentor groups. Um, we're finalizing kind of like all of the words and numbers groups. And we're also finalizing um, what new student peer mentor is assigned to what student. And they have your emails and they're actually gonna send an email out to all the students soon, kind of letting them know about what's going on with kind of like, um, new student orientation, kind of like seeing what group they're in and kind of getting like acclimated to the Lewis and Clark environment. So yes. Great, okay. So that is all we have to present to you today. Um, and it's a chance now if you have questions that 
haven't been answered or um, maybe they just popped up or maybe you just popped into the webinar, feel free to use the Q&A to type any questions in there. Um, and I'm going to pass it to my panelists. If there are any questions in the Q&A that you can answer now, go for it. Yeah, I see a question here from um, someone who's asking about water disposal and dumpsters and laundry. So I'm happy to answer that. Um, so all of our residential halls and buildings uh, have dumpsters located either right outside of the buildings or very close nearby the buildings. Chances are you'll probably walk by or drive by those dumpsters before you're, you make your way into the residential hall. Um, that being said, information like this, if you're needing help navigating, someone should be on site during move-in day who could help direct you direct you towards those dumpsters. Um, or you could always email your area director who will be sending out uh, an email ahead of your arrival. And you could ask for a map with um, that information about dumpsters uh, kind of highlighted or annotated. Um, as far as laundry goes, Laundry is available and free for all of our residential students. Um, students do need to download an app to uh, operate the laundry um, within their residential buildings. That being said, there's a laundry room on um, almost every hall, if not on your floor, probably up or down one floor or so. Um, Finally, the question about water disposal, I'm not exactly sure um, what this question is asking, uh, but I can share that the sinks and kitchens don't have a garbage disposal in the sinks, um, but water itself uh, in Portland, the Portland tap water is absolutely safe to drink and as Colin can attest, delicious, delicious water here in Portland. Um, <laughs> Also, um, a little thing about laundry, um, it's free. So that's a very nice thing about living on campus and having free laundry. Yes. Yes, you can't uh, say that you're um, not able to do your clothes. There's absolutely always um, <laughs> a space and time for, for washing clothes and sheets. Um, I see that another student here has a question about uh, renting a mini fridge and microwave unit and upcoming deadlines. So this Friday, we are um, sharing out roommate assignments. That is very exciting. They will be sent to students via email. Um, although there are some um, deadlines that um, Collegiate Concepts uh, posts, um, students are still able to request a um, mini fridge unit after those deadlines. So you and your roommate should still be able to connect over the weekend, make some decisions and still apply for a mini fridge rental um, sometime early next week. That being said, if you're running into any issues on their website, you're welcome to email us and we can help facilitate some overlap between um, Collegiate Concepts, the mini fridge uh, vendor and students in their roommate groups. Um, I'm just going to keep going. On this, so feel free to feel free to interrupt me. Um, I see that someone has a question on the best area to drop off for Platt Howard Hall. Um, so check in for Platt Howard is going to be in front of um, the Platt Residence Hall, not Howard Hall. Um, so Platt will need to be your first stop as someone is pointing to on the map. Um, that being said, depending on your assignment in Howard, you might find that you'll want to kind of swoop down from Platt into the Howard parking lot um, to uh, access the um, garden level, the first or the second floor of Howard. Um, but if you actually live in Platt or the third floor of Howard, the Platt main lounge connects via Skybridge to the third floor of Howard. So if you're moving into Howard floor three, you might just want to use that Platt main lounge um, to access Platt Howard. Um, some more questions. There's a lot of these laundry questions. Colin, do you want to answer the detergent questions? Yeah, I think that's, unfortunately, we don't have laundry detergent. Actually, no, we do have laundry detergent. Um, I forgot. 
Um, in Fowler Center, we actually have a machine that dispenses um, kind of like sustainable laundry pads um, that are really good for the environment. So they're going to be in, they're usually right outside Fields Dining Hall. That's where the kind of like little machine is placed. Um, but personally, I don't rely on it because sometimes it has to be refilled and sometimes um, a bunch of students use it at once and it has to get refilled and there's no laundry things. So I literally just, I'm, I'm a Tide's potter. I just kind of throw them in and it works. Um, and usually I just need one or two for a load. So that's my, that's my little detergent story. I think that's excellent advice. <laughs> Keep the questions coming. If you have any other questions, we, anything regarding arriving to campus, water bottle refill stations on campus. Yes. In the yes. dorm? Yes. That's awesome. a two yeses. There's one, wow. usually there's one on every floor from where I've lived in Copeland and for where I lived in Aiken, there are both water bottle um, kind of like refill stations, really like on every floor, like really close to the dormitories, which is nice. And in all of our classrooms too, and in our Fowler Student Center, we got it everywhere. Um, yes, check-in, referring to check-in, so um, checking in to New student orientation will happen normally on the 28th, regardless if you are on an NST. Um, Fran with check in to their housing, to their residence hall, does that, will that will happen on the 27th, right? Yeah, so if you're on an NST, when you come back from the NST on the 27th, College Outdoors will direct you down to um, the undergraduate campus to check in with campus living at our central office here in the Odell Annex. And then you'll make your way back up to the graduate school campus to help with the um, unloading of your NST van. Um, and then once you're done unloading from your NST, you'll then move into your residential hall room on the, um, on the 27th. On the 28th, if you haven't been on an NST, that's where you'll check in for orientation and then make your way directly to your residential hall room. Um, let's see, for those doing the arts week, um, besides clothes and bedding and other necessities, we're moving them in at the normal orientation. Um, to clarify, the on campus NSC, which is the arts PDX, arts PDX on campus, you will be moving directly into your uh, room assignment for the fall semester. So you will, the day that you get here for that trip, which will stay on campus, you will get to move whatever you want into that dorm. Um, Fran, do you have anything to add with that? Yeah, I think the the option would just be up to you if you already have a lot of your items and it's easy for you just to like bring them into your room when you arrive for your Creative Arts PDX NST, you are welcome to do that. If you want to make that day of arrival for your NST really easy and simple and you want family members to bring the rest of your stuff on the 28th, that's also okay. I think it's more of just a personal preference. I will say if you do come with all of your items on the day of your arts arrival move-in, it will be very um, pretty empty in the halls. There won't be a lot of other people checking in, which could be nice in terms of navigating uh, things from your car into the residential room. So again, that choice is, is a bit up to you as to how many hands you have helping and what works maybe more on a logistics side. That's fine. Bed size, twin XL. Twin, yes. twin extra large. Yep. Judith and Colin, do you remember your move-in day or is it just a I do. 
I do remember my move-in day. And to this day, I'm still very happy that my duvet, I got it in a size queen. So that way I can loft my bed and use the underside as storage. And kind of like use my duvet to cover the fact that that's storage. So it just looks nice, clean, and pretty. Um, so I like that. I do like to maximize my space. Um, but yeah, it was a good time. I enjoyed it. I lived in Manzanita my first year. So forest move in. Um, the debt, I can answer that question. Um, the dorm rooms also have a dresser a um a set of dressers one that's like a standing dresser as well um a desk and some of them may have like a small side table as well and a desk chair and a desk chair yes the lofting of the beds is really easy there's um little hooks on the sides of the what are they called? Like the bedsides, there's little hooks that go and they'll move up and down depending on how tall you want your bed. If you do want your bed um, rather than just like raised on its rings, but if you want your bed lofted so that you can have space underneath your bed, um, that is an option that we're bringing back for this year. Students in their assignment email will receive more information about bed modifications, and you can also apply for a bed modification or a bed lofting um, before your arrival. Uh, I see that someone asked something, saw, asked about hanging clothes up in the room. Um, as Judith just mentioned, there are armoires in the rooms. Uh, Aiken is the uh, nice uh, residence hall rooms that have walk-in closets, um, but everywhere else has armoires that will definitely have space for um, clothes hooks and um, hanging anything that you might want to not keep folded up. There's some additional drawers in the armoire as well as the stacking drawers that Judith mentioned come in um in the residence hall rooms. Sometimes those stacking drawers are again more so built into the walls. Um, our residence halls are all a little bit different in styles. They all have um comparable amenities, but some do have freestanding furniture and some have furniture built into the physical space. So just keep that in mind when it comes to um storage containers and things like that. As far as the storage container sizes that fit under the beds, um, I can actually pull up. I have the measurements of how tall beds are when they're set at the standard height from the bed. Give me one moment. Um, so your bed will be set to a standard height unless you request a modification to be made to your bed. So at the standard height, the top of the mattress is 22 inches off the floor. And I would say that you have a good solid six to eight inches with the the mattress and the bed frame maybe 10 so i'm not sure how helpful that is but at the standard height you you have a lot of depth underneath the bed but not a ton of height for a larger um kind of storage container to fit underneath there how many hangers would you say is enough is a tricky question <laughs> that is a very difficult question. To be honest, for me, um, I realized that there's a maximum of hangers that you can fit in these armoires. <laughs> I think I brought like, I brought 40. And I think this is on the very high end. I was really like squishing it in there very violently. <laughs> um, but I think 40 hangers is enough. Um, I usually also um hang my pants um so I usually get like 10 pant hangers as well um but yeah it depends how much clothes you have I think you could fit 40 in the armoires but I definitely bring two or three extra hangers just if you if you grab a jacket maybe you're thrifting you grab a jacket I recommend that oh wait I have another great question 
Um, is there a spot to look at the rooms prior to moving once the student gets their room assignment? That is a very great question. Um, and the reality is, is that we, um, all of, I feel we have videos on the Lewis and Clark um, webpage where current students kind of give a tour of their dormitory, of their kind of room before um, you arrive on campus. You can't see the exact room, but a lot of the videos on the website are a fair and good representation of what your um, kind of like room is gonna look like once you move in. And just to add to that, uh, this summer, we've been having our student workers uh, start a project in which they've been taking photos of standard rooms within our residential halls. So if you are curious about your room's configuration, we can share with you what the standard, uh, a photo of the standard room type that you're in, for example, a Copeland double. It might not be your exact Copeland double, but we could share um, some photos to help you kind of get a, a sense of the layout of the room, whether that's a double, a quad, a triple, or a single. So that is something that you could email the living account with and um, someone in our office could uh, supply that sample image. Um, just to kind of rapid fire a few of these questions, someone asked if chairs uh, in the rooms are padded. I don't believe they are. I believe that they're wooden and or plastic chairs. They don't have padding on them. Um, someone asked if command hooks are allowed. Command hooks are allowed. Uh, the one caveat is going to be um, checking what your wall um, is before you hang those up. Uh, we do have different walls that are both drywall as well as um, some type of, um, oh, I'm totally blinking on, on it. Um, brick. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Completely forgetting the word brick is embarrassing. Um, but some all that to say is some of them stick better on certain materials than others. So just keep that in mind before you... Um, stick up a bunch of expensive command hooks only to realize that they're not gonna stick very well onto the brick. Yeah, I and also to bounce off of that, do not go cheap on the command hooks. There are like, my first year, I bought like some really cheap timu.com like command hooks that were kind of knockoffs. They do not peel off as well as the command hooks. So I was unfortunately fine for leaving giant holes in the side of my dormitory. So please spend the extra dollar, get the command hooks, um, <laughs> and yeah. Uh, and then finally, I we have a question about laundry baskets. Um, honestly, unless your student is living on the same floor as a laundry machine, chances are the laundry is probably gonna be on a slightly different floor. And all of our first year housing does not have elevators. My suggestion would be not to get something with wheels. It's just gonna make it easier year after year to know that your laundry basket is gonna work regardless of which residence hall room you're assigned to. Um, so that would be my suggestion. That being said, if your student has an accessibility need uh, and they've worked with OSA for an accommodation to keep their items on the same floor as their room, then I think a rolling um, laundry basket would work just fine. I don't know what other thoughts might be from Judith and Colin on that. Uh, I put my laundry basket under my bed. Nice. For me, I recommend going with a laundry basket that it's not just mesh. It's usually can stand up on its own. Um, because I felt like a lot of my peers and me, myself included, um, when I had a laundry basket, it was kind of just a mesh bag and it was kind of like, just like fumbling all over the place. So I got this kind of like more sturdy one where I can just slide into the corner of my room and it, it looks nice and still. How many people typically to a floor that share a bathroom. I'm sure this really depends on the hall that you're in. Do you have kind of a range that we could get? Yeah, hall floors can have anywhere from 10 to 20 people, really depending on the, the building, the hall, and the floor that you're assigned to. That being said, we do ratio everything when it comes to the number of students assigned to a 
floor and then the number of bathroom facilities. So regardless of where you're assigned, there should be a ratio of students to bathrooms and toilets and showers um, is what I can comment on kind of that. And then just to um, remind folks, we do have a all gender housing model here. So outside of our single gender floors, bathrooms, in our facilities are all gender and we don't have a gender designation. So everyone on the floor is able to use and share those bathroom spaces with each other. Bathrooms are cleaned regularly, if not daily, by our cleaning service, a and &A. Abby, do you wanna just take a last <laughs> question? Yes, uh, bathrooms do have cubbies for students to store their items in. Um, I do suggest a shower caddy just to take your things to and from the shower, but yes, you can absolutely store your items in the bathroom cubbies. Bring shower shoes. Bring mm. shower shoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thanks, Judith, and thanks, everybody. I'm going to call it here. Um, if you have questions, of course, you can reach out to firstyearatlclark.edu, or also if you have specific housing questions, living at lclark.edu. Get excited. Friday's coming and your housing assignments are coming. I can't believe it. Um, final reminders this week, the last week of your checklist, registering for classes tomorrow. Good luck, everyone. It's going to go great. Super smooth. We love Web Advisor. Everything's going to go great. Um, and then Friday, your second day of registration. You're going to register for one class on the first day and two on the um, second day, unless you're a transfer student, in which case you would likely uh, register for three on that second day. Um, submitting service day forms. So get into Give Pulse. Again, if you're having trouble with any of these things, uh, please reach out to us. We can help troubleshoot and fix anything on our end. Uh, the new student survey is coming your way, so check your email for that. Um, and then also keep an eye out for the common reading coming uh, soon. Does anyone have any final comments or anything that they want to uh, chime in on our last webinar here for these eight checklist weeks? Okay, amazing. Thank you so much. And we will potentially see you in the future we might be looking at some future webinars. Um, just keep an eye out for an email from us and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thanks.